Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for attending. Uh, I'm not sure what you're expecting from the next hour, but I can promise you uh, we will exceed your expectations and uh, make your investment of time uh, well worthwhile. I'm Jeff Metzner, Yale School of Management, class of 2008, um, uh, brand manager at Procter & Gamble since 2008, and I have the honor of introducing our distinguished guest today, uh, Mr. John Pepper. Uh, I think that you'll see today that John uh, truly embodies uh, what's core to missions of both uh, Yale and P&G, uh, which makes him so special and unique and such a wonderful fit at, at both institutions. Uh, what's core to both of our companies is service, or both of our institutions is, is service. Service to society is uh, part of Yale's mission and obviously service to our consumers. Uh, and to our shareholders and, and um, uh, in effect, society as well at, uh, at P&G through superior value creation. Uh, I used the word distinguished uh, previously, and uh, it is woefully inadequate to describe John, but I'll list a few of his uh, titles here, and then uh, you'll hear from him a few remarks uh, from John, and hopefully we can have an engaging session today uh, with uh, lots of questions and interaction from you. Um, that's where uh, we'll find the most value here. But uh, some of John's uh, titles include former chairman and CEO of Procter & Gamble, uh, where he had an honorable career for uh, 40 years, uh, former chairman of a small company you may have heard of, uh, the Walt Disney Company, uh, honorary co-chairman of the uh, National Underground Railroad uh, Fre Freedom Center in Cincinnati, VP of Finance and Administration at Yale College, um, where he uh, graduated uh, in 1960 uh, and it, where he served on the board of uh, the Yale Daily News. Uh, mentor to hundreds, including uh, several in this room. Uh, husband to Francie for more years than I've been alive. Father to four, grandfather to eight. Please join me in welcoming our guest, Mr. John Pepper. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Well, it's a treat to be here. Um, we're going to spend all but no more than 10 minutes with this in talking questions that you've got of me. Uh, it's a treat to be back here. I was asked in a period of 10 minutes to describe my career, my successes, my pitfalls, and all the learnings along the way. The demand on that for selectivity is awesome. A little bit on my career. Uh, my career would be validation that you never really know what's possible. Um, I uh, graduated from Yale in 1960, three years in the Navy. My Navy scholarship got me through Yale. I couldn't have afforded to come without it. Three years in the Navy, absolutely certain I would go to law school, admitted to Harvard Law School, and deciding that I'd take one year off to go into business. But having run around the North Atlantic and destroyers, I wasn't quite ready to go back to the stacks, even though my kids would have said I was a nerd. About all I did was study, other than the Yale Daily News, where I happened to run into some recruiters from Procter & Gamble in 1958 who had a sparkle in their eyes. They talked about what I was getting their money for, recruiting. I asked them what they were so excited about, and they went on to describe this thing called brand management. And five years later, I remembered the sparkle in the eye. That's all I remembered. And I thought, I'll try to get to Procter & Gamble. And I did, <laughs> 39 years later, I retired. I still feel part of it. And from this comes this series of connected dots as you've already had in your life and you'll continue to experience you never could have expected. Because having there, I came back for the first time to Yale on my 25th reunion, first time I came back, uh, 1985. After than that, my first time of uh, any involvement was with SOM in 1987, a long time ago. I joined the Yale Corporation, of course, and then did come back here. I worked two, for two delightful years as head of finance and administration uh, for the university. Along the way, it's very unlikely, uh, they asked me to join the board of, of Disney. Uh, and uh, after five months, they asked me to become chairman. I thought they'd lost their mind. <laughs> I pointed out there were quite a few people who had more experience. And as Jeff mentioned, I've got a family wonderful family, a wonderful wife, who has made all the difference in my life, and four children and eight grandchildren. So I've been really, really lucky, really lucky. I pinch myself that here I am. And along the way, I taught an SOM class 
and I still remember it. It was in, 19, it was in the year 2000, I taught a class on leadership. And I am still in touch with two of the students, 14 years later, as they've gone on to do great things. Uh, you know what, there are other things they asked me to talk about here, and you can, it's success, what are the greatest successes, what have been the biggest pitfalls, what have been the major learnings. You know what, I'm not even gonna address them right now. You can bring, bring me back to any of those that you might choose. I've left on your table there a couple of pieces of paper which I'm not going to review as such. I was asked, uh, the one is do's and don'ts. At the end of a talk I was giving to a management group, not at P&G some years ago, uh, they said, listen, would you take 60 seconds to just sum up management do's and don'ts, just like that. And after I got comments on my talk, pretty much nobody heard anything other than my do's and don'ts. So I said, I'm gonna write them down, and that's what I said at that time. And then the others, this I believe. I put them in front of you only because they might invite a question uh, about one of them that you might have. So that's all they are, I'm not going over them as such. But again, maybe you'd see something there, you'd say, that looks kind of interesting. Maybe he'd say a little bit more about that. <laughs> so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, if I could. And uh, we'll just get into questions. We have a few that have been prepared in advance. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but then I really want to get to your questions. Whatever you want me to talk about, I, I will, and I'll try to, at least try to. Yeah, so be thinking about what you want to ask John. He's had such a tremendous experience and tremendous successes, and maybe even some regrets along the way. That there are probably one or two of them. <laughs> and so it'll be great to hear about all of those. Yeah. Uh, let me start off with uh, actually a question about that, because we were chatting a bit about this earlier, and you mentioned this is an, uh, an interesting idea. At the School of Management, we teach this how do you approach decisions and how do you make the decision process you know, most likely to give you a good outcome? Right. It's a unique thing actually to SLM when we're quite happy with it. And so I was wondering if you could, the students often ask me when I'm in this class, you know, how, do you, how do you actually do this in an organization? And so if I could hear about some, or we could all hear about some decisions that you made that you might have regretted and say, how could I have made that decision process a little better? And some things I could have done differently with some of those regrets, we'd love to learn from those. All right. Well, I think of instances, um, an ingredient I don't know if any of you would have heard of called Restra, which was a fat substitute that we brought out, we put into um, potato chips, Frito-Lay and Pringles. And it fulfilled every bit of its um, technical hopes, aspirations, that is it cut fat uh, dramatically, cut calories in half, uh, but it came under vicious attack, an inappropriate attack, some of you are nodding, you know of maybe the case. Uh, and the decision that we, could have and should have reached differently there was probably to put it into doctor recommended uh, pharmaceutical health products in the beginning to get the healthcare pedigree absolutely uh, assured. Now, you always look back and see a decision you could have made differently, but let me address the process point, be, using it as an example. And that is, that was one of those decisions where I do not believe we really had a forum of people who had knowledge of the subject, perhaps with different points of view, where we could really debate the strategic alternatives uh, and see with the different ways to go. And we didn't bring everybody together. And there's a danger, uh, at least in my experience in decision-making process, where you'll be dealing with individual functions, experts, one-on-one -on -one, or maybe one-on-two, -on -two, but you won't have everybody in the room. And this would be the, 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 the meeting that says, we're gonna get all the options on the table and everybody is gonna speak up for what they see is the pro and con of that. Uh, we were talking about, maybe this is a little different, but we were talking before you came up about my experience at Pixar, uh, Pixar Films. And th this is under the heading of how do, you, how do you get an environment, a process, if you will, that encourages creativity. And what they do at Pixar, and there's a book that was written by Ed Catmull, I recommend to all of you who haven't read it, called Creativity, Inc. Uh, it is truly one of the finest books on business I've ever read, but in particular, how do you create a, an environment, a creative environment? And uh, they have something called the Brain Trust. Uh, and the Brain Trust comes together right at the very beginning of, say, a script or an idea or concept for a new movie. Up, you name it. And the purpose of the Brain Trust is to have a full-fledged airing of different points of view and perspectives to try to build a good story. And Ed Catmull in his book, says the brain trust is really important because on the first submission, the first go around, 
all the movies that Pixar has had suck. That was his word. And he said, I don't want to prettify the word, they suck. Uh, and he uses the example, for example, Up. Did any of you see the movie Up? The man and little boy and the dog and the big bird. Uh, well, Ed in his book says that if you go back to that movie in the first script, the only thing in common between the first script and the final movie were the balloons and the other was the big bird. And everything else was different. Uh, the old man, little boy, the dog was different and it came out of a process. Now what the, makes the brain trust work? And he says is two things. One, the people making the comments have a right to make comments. They're informed. They know something. They've done good work. And second, their comments carry no authority. The people receiving them is rec are receiving those comments as input from respected peers. They don't have to do anything with them other than listen and take what they want. In corporate America, certainly, and I've been, we don't have enough brain trust type convocations of people. We're in so much of a rush. We have pre preconceived ideas that we don't bring these people together to do that. So maybe I'll, I'll stop with that. Those are examples, or I can elaborate if you'd want. Those are, those are great examples. Let me ask you kind of a related question. A lot of the companies you're in, certainly Pixar and certainly P&G, are great examples of innovative companies. They sustain innovation over the long term. What are the keys to sustaining innovation over time in a company, and what are the key barriers you might have found that you had to overcome to make an innovation? That's a great question. Um, it's certainly relevant to both, both Disney and Procter and & Gamble and any company. Not necessarily in order of priority. One, you have to believe that innovation and new creation of new ideas is absolutely fundamental. And that has to start at the top of the company. And nothing, nothing can be more important than that belief. Now it's not founded simply on some spiritual movement. Uh, it also has to be founded on history. And most companies forget their history. They don't, if they track back and see where did you do well and where did you not do well, and you relate that to the lack of or presence of innovation, at least in a company like P&G or in Disney, the correlation is perfect. Second, you have to have, um, you have to have an organization design that provides a space for innovation to take place on a continuing basis. In Disney, it's Imagineering, perhaps most importantly. There are many parts of it in Disney, but the Imagineering group, which I happened to be with 10 days ago, uh, their whole reason for existence is to create something new. And they are a privileged group. And it's a space for people who are a bit different. And the creative person in many companies, including p g has to be in some ways protected. Has to be protected. And they may be different in some ways. They have to be protected. Next, you've got to fund it. You cannot allow a quarterly requirement to meet a goal or an annual meeting to shut off the upstream development of innovation. It happens. I've seen it. This isn't a theoretical point I'm making. I've seen it happen and it comes home to roost. It would be like cutting off recruiting. If Procter & Gamble stopped recruiting for a year on this campus or two years, we'd lose our way. I really believe that. that's why we're here. Um, I, was, I said to the, this to the Imagineers last week. I said, you, ask yourself, use inversion. What would cause Disney to fail? What would cause Walt Disney World to no longer be attracting three or four percent more people every year with higher ticket prices? You know what it would be? It would be because it starts to get stale. It would be if Universal down the road, instead of just having one big thing, Harry Potter, started to have five or six. And instead of the family spending four days at Disney World, going through four parks, they'd say, we'll spend three or four days at Universal, and we'll come over to Disney for a day. And that will happen if they're not continuing to innovate. Procter & Gamble, today we have the leading share of the laundry detergent category with a 42.6 share on Tide. Now only somebody from P&G with my heritage would say that with such pride. 42.6%. That is a brand that has been accosted by hundreds of brands in that market and will continue to be and to have almost a majority of that market with all those brands. However, two times in our history we lost 25% of our share. Literally 25%, I mean 10 share points, 40 to 30. Why? We lost our way in innovation. 
We get it back, why? Come out with Tide Pods. I don't know, any of you use Tide Pods? Little things, don't you? So you should use those. They're very good. <laughs> you should use those. Um, uh, but it, again, that's going back to the history. So you've got to spend for it. It has to be advocated as the highest priority other than people and values. Or it has to be a, a, a design in your organization has to have space for it. And you have to have a very diverse appreciation of different people and the, what they bring to it. Interesting. If you look, Motorola had a 70 share of the cell phone market. 70 share, it's now three. Eastman Kodak, with the whole photographic market when I was growing up as a kid, I use, when I talk to a PNG audience, I use the newspaper report that said Eastman Kodak is going out of the film business to just show what can happen if you're not ahead of the curve and you're not thinking of what can happen next. That's what can happen. And what can happen on the other side is a tied, I mean, a, an iPod, I mean, I'm sorry, an iPad, which I can remember Steve Jobs bringing into the Disney meeting for the very first time. And relating to us, there were a lot of people in the company that thought he was nuts. Who is gonna want an iPad? When you already have an iPod and you've got a Mac computer, who will carry another thing around? Well, we know what happened. We know what happened. That was vision. And there were previous versions of iPads. Motorola had one called the Envoy. And, the, and they gave up on the concept. And the times changed. And 4G came in. And they kept thinking of the consumer. What would be valuable? Improve the technology. Improve the design. I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you. It's interesting you mentioned Tide and the 42% share, which is amazing given it's a laundry detergent and the idea that people will pay a premium and seek out a particular brand of laundry detergent, which we may think of as a, you know, a nearly a commodity potentially in its physical characteristics. You know, one of the things that separates P&G, I think, from many other companies is their ability to brand and to connect with consumers in such a, a great way. And so one of the questions that you know, I wonder about is, beyond just the numbers, how do you know when you've really connected to consumers? How do you, how do, you do marketing and branding in a way that you know, allows you to have this 42% share for? So. Well, I think most simply, I, I, I feel you know it when you can talk with them, see by behavior, but talk with them and you know the brand is playing an important part in their life. I can remember being in an apartment in Beijing uh, many years ago and I was sitting there on the floor with a wonderful young mom who was serving us tea. And we were there to talk about Pampers diapers. And uh, I asked her, how did she like Pampers? And she said, we really like it. And I asked her, why? And she said, well, I, I like it because it makes my baby look smart. And because it helps him sleep through the night. And I think that's helpful to his development. Well, when somebody says something like that to you, you know why you're in business. Mm -hmm. And you know you've made a connection, first and foremost, through the brand, through the product. How does it work? I mean, it's got to work. I mean, you know damn well the diaper isn't working. In fact, she showed me another product before I left that wasn't working. She showed me always a whisper, and the end flap was not sealed. She said, look at this, and I felt terrible. I mean, you know, she could have been by spending her money on many other things, more food, more clothes, furniture. This was a very, very poor apartment. They felt an enormous responsibility that every print, everything we provide has to work really well to try to benefit and be at the best price. And here she had something that didn't. I think it is really this feeling you have that it's, and, and the brand won't be successful if this doesn't happen. Like Folgers, which is a brand that we had, best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. Best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. I don't know how many of you drink coffee. How many of you drink coffee? How many of you drink coffee? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, are you, are you like me? I mean, waking up in the morning, getting a cup of coffee, I don't know if it's the best part of waking up, probably the best part for somebody my age is simply waking up. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this, this comes in, it's a, pretty, it's, a pretty good, it's a pretty good thing. And um, it's being part of a life, so it becomes part of life. It's not a cure for cancer, and it doesn't assume the highest level of what a family re reaction is, but it has to play that kind of a role based on how it performs. And, it, and it's getting feedback beyond a share number. But if, if, you didn't have that, if, if you didn't have that feeling with family, you wouldn't have that share number. And if you weren't innovating, you wouldn't keep it or keep building it. Great. Yeah. Great. 
Thank you, John. So I want to open it up now yes. for some questions from the audience. We can come back to some others later. You're very you good at asking questions, I know. I've had that experience. Who's going to start? Yeah. You know, going back to the culture, um, and then let me deal with that very important <laughs> aspect of maintaining or building it. Uh, I mean, the culture I've always seen is one where people during their career, and certainly looking back on the five or 10 year mark, will have the feeling I had, which is, while every day is not a bevy of fun, I'm really glad I found this place. That I can't imagine being in a better place. And of course, what produces that more than anything, um, is the feeling that you can do your thing, a sense of ownership, that you matter, your ideas can be, will be respected and they, you can put them into action, or uh, that you're in a culture that has values of, of integrity, nothing more than integrity, it speaks truth, expects truth, worships truth almost. Um, it has a, a culture of respect for other people, which you have to really cr create because you're going, people going so fast. If we had to sum up my attitude toward people in two words, those two words would be everybody counts. Everyone counts. That's it. I mean, it sounds maybe banal, but everyone counts. And if you really believe that, from it will come listening to other people in a way that they know you really are listening, uh, being open to a different point of view than your own, to hear it, consider it, maybe through their eyes. And, and a feeling in the end, of great ownership. One of the great things about Procter & Gamble, great thing about Disney, is the sense of ownership people have for what they, they do. Another aspect of it is, how, how does another person react when you tell them you work at this company? When you ask somebody, where do you work, and you say, I work at the Walt Disney Company, you almost will always get a smile. And maybe somebody will say, can you get me a free pass? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got, a, I've got a young child that, you know, he'd be really great on this. And Procter & Gamble, I think it's much the same way. And, and how do you feel in saying that? I mean, when I could say I'm on the board of P&G, I'm on the board of Disney, I felt proud in saying that. Where does that grow from? It grows from a culture of, of winning, that you're good at what you do. It's of, of mutual respect, integrity, values that may not totally align, but almost totally align with your own personal values. Nothing is more important than an empowering culture for people and maintaining it with all the things that come against it which is, you know, move quickly to a, get to a result, and you have to. You can't sit around as a debating society uh, forever. To your question about hiring and firing, is that the word you used, hiring and firing? Yeah. Um, the hiring part, I think, is pretty simple. You're doing the best you can to expose what we are and who we are and what we represent. That's why internships are so important uh, to not just the student, but to the company, because people are seeing what's it like, and is this my cup of tea? Um, and then to the extent we can in interviews, and it's never perfect, you're trying to sense, is this the kind of person who's down to earth, got a lot of integrity, high em emphasis on excellence, whatever they do, quality. <laughs> uh, you, you, you obviously try to do that on the hiring side. And again, the internships really help. It's interesting you talk firing. Uh, and how you handle the fact you have surplus employees. I won't say it's the most difficult, but it's one of the most difficult challenges one faces. Because you do have to face up uh, to a couple things. One, sometimes it's just not a good fit. Sometimes it's just not a good fit. That's pretty rare in PNG uh, because of the, the recruiting process is so thorough and uh, the talent of the young men and women who join us is so good. But sometimes that's the case. Um, and sometimes, of course, a person will just decide, this isn't my cup of tea after being with it. But other times, we'll find that we're just a restructuring. We've gotten too, quote, fat. Or we're in a situation like we were in Russia, where we acquire a plant which has got 3,000 employees. And we know perfectly well, perfectly well from the get-go, that in the end, 
even as it grows fourfold, we won't need more than 700. That's a true story. So how do you handle that? One, you can't just say at 3,000. The question is, how do you get to where you need to end up with the greatest respect and valuing of people's lives and careers possible? And what you do there is what you would do. You're trying to use your imagination. In Russia, what we did, and we literally went from 300 to 3,000 to 700, now we're back, I think, to 1,100 or 1,200 because we've got the leading business in Russia, um, is we, we created a couple of businesses that they were in that we didn't want to be in, linoleum, for example, and we put some money in it and let a group of workers go off and run the linoleum business. That was pretty easy. It was imaginative, but it was very straightforward. We offered retirement packages. They hardly existed in Russia before we were there. Uh, and what we did was not magnanimous, but was to offer two or three years' salary, which in those terms was not that much. Uh, and we handled, and you know to this day, and this was 12 years ago, that we had the major reduction that we had to. We get no more positive comment from employees in Russia today in a sense of ownership. They'll look back on how we handled that. And it wasn't perfect, and people got hurt. I'm not everybody moved through that and just said, oh, life's hunky-dory. But I think we did it about as well as we could, and pretty darn well. Everybody has to be handled with respect. And, uh, and that doesn't eliminate the pain from it entirely. I mean, not fool you, or you wouldn't be fooled anyway. Uh, but you do it out of respect for other people. And the fact that anyone who joins us it's not just a person, they're an amazing person. And we help place them and we put them into another job if that happens. Our key is we gotta keep growing. Uh, one person, one of our former CEOs, Howard Morgans, <coughs> once said there are a number of reasons why it's important to grow. Um, one is it shows you have better brands. Two, that's what your shareholders deserve. He said, but third, a point that's often missed is it's growth that provides careers for people. It's growth that allows for more careers. Thank you. So I was said before that there's sometimes I get a question after all the number of students I've talked with that I've never heard before. And I've never heard anyone ask before, how does firing affect a culture? And it has to be handled very carefully or it can make all the thing about people, which is what I believe and we've all believed is the most important thing. It's all about people and values in any corporation, any organization. And whatever you decide to do, be as sure as you can that the place you're going has values that you respect. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Oh. Um, I'm interested in hearing about your perspective um, at being at a large CPG company that's growing and acquiring then uh, other companies. And in particular, I'm interested in this whole movement of a lot of organic, sustainable companies being bought out by larger companies. Sorry, can you hear me? Um, Half. So I'm interested in, in hearing about what it's like to work at a growing company that's uh, acquiring a smaller company. And what that's like, in particular, with these sustainable organic companies being bought out by larger companies like a Unilever, P&G, and how that smaller company can maintain its culture, but also how a P&G or Unilever, or, you know, larger company can um, incorporate its own values in, and, and what that dynamic is like. Well, it's, this very, it's, it's a very sensitive subject. Um, I mean, the key in doing it, if I think of IAMS uh, that we acquired, we no longer have, I think of Richardson Vicks, which we acquired, uh, I think of the acquisition of Pixar by Disney and now Marvel by Disney. Uh, the, the key is to, to maintain, first and foremost, I'd say, the key people. Absolutely have to do that. Um, and the other is to make sure our mind is open to what they do so well that made us to want to acquire them in the first place and see where we can bring that into our own operations. When we acquired Gillette, P&G did maybe 10 years ago, there were a lot of things Gillette was doing that were different than we were, and some of them were much smarter than what we were doing. They, they went nuts when they saw the degree of emphasis we put on written material. On the other hand, some degree of written material really helps the thinking process. So being open to adjusting, modifying what we do, 
Uh, it's very important that we bring the people both ways. Uh, that's a very practical thing, bringing Gillette people into Procter & Gamble and Procter & Gamble people into Gillette so we get to know each other and how we operate. Uh, the mindset that is in there that can be really bad is we got it all figured out. We, the acquiring company, have it all figured out. We're acquiring someone else or the other company feeling somehow that I'm being on the defensive too much uh, before because they've been acquired. I'd say the most successful mergers that I've seen in my experience, and you probably studied others that might be even better, would be Pixar. Um, John Lasseter and Ed Catmull were frightened to death when they heard that Disney was going to acquire Pixar. Steve Jobs, who was the co-founder with them, uh, went to him, knew Bob, Bob, Bob Iger, one of the great leaders I've ever known. And Steve Jobs went to John Lasseter and Ed Catmull and said, we're gonna be fine. I wouldn't do this if I didn't know we were gonna be fine. And to help you believe that even more, I want you to go meet Bob Iger. And they came back talking to Bob Iger, and they said, for the first time, we heard somebody saying, we want to learn what you're doing so we can do it in Disney animation. That spoke volumes. Just a few words of honest respect, deeply felt respect, respect that was going to be turned into action. So those are the thoughts that come to my mind. Um, things you don't do is come in like a blunderbuss. The other thing you also have to recognize, you have merged. And there are going to be certain things that are going to be common in values that you're going to do. And hopefully you haven't made a merger where you think the values are different. And we looked at Richards and Vicks and Unilever had made an unfriendly offer for it and brought us in. We never would have acquired it if Unilever hadn't made an unfriendly offer and they didn't want to go with Unilever. Uh, we were really fortunate that a retired P&G executive, Walter Lingle, had retired and gone on the Richards and Vicks board. And we only had about 72 hours to decide whether we were going to bid for this company. And, and Lingle came to us and he, they said, he said, you've got to do this. He said, they believe in brands, they believe in people, their values, their commitment to the consumer exactly like ours, so go ahead. What he was able to say about the value system meant the world to us, meant the world. Yeah. the importance of having genuine care for the people and the importance of creating tremendous long-lasting impact on people. And I was wondering, who was that person for you and what was the event for you that allowed you to grow and develop into the person you are today? Yeah, that's, thank you. That's a great question. I wrote a paper some years ago titled, If It Weren't For Them. If It Weren't For Them. And I put down on that paper, If It Weren't For Them, uh, I was really talking business, certainly if it weren't for them, it would start from my wife, and that may sound like some rhetorical flourish. That, that's what old married people say about their spouses. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's really true, because I was really a very inward person, and she brought me out. And when I married her, because I'd had to fight for three or four years to persuade her to marry me, I tried everything today they would have arrested me as a stalker. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was putting notes under her windshield and under her car and well, all kinds, of, I won't get into the detail. <laughs> but in a, in, a, in a business context, um, there were several people. It was the first boss I had when I asked him if I could do something nobody had done at that age before, a brand budget review, he said, go ahead. No questions, just go ahead. Ed Arts, to uh, I reported to for half my career, the CEO ahead of me at P&G had been defined as the Prince of Darkness to me. Prince of Darkness, I was told as you go in, you better be really careful, be prepared before you meet him. And he spent hours with me, hours with me, one-on-one -on -one in his office with all the responsibility he had, talking to me about this competitive report or this research study, what more could we get out of it? I wouldn't be with P&G today if he hadn't done that. I simply wouldn't have been. I could not believe how he cared about me. And, and he wasn't saying, geez, you're great, John. He never, he didn't say that. But the attention he paid, the care he paid, <coughs> so that kind of I felt, I can't believe this. It seems like I matter to this guy. It's kind of how I felt. Uh, Jack Claggett, another guy. I was single at the time. He kept asking me to his house for the weekend to the point actually well, I was starting to feel awkward and saying no because I wanted to do some other things on the weekend. 
and go to his house. Uh, but it showed how much he cared. Um, Ed Harness. I'll tell you one story and then I'll we'll go open other questions, but it, because it's such an important point. The impact we have on other people by the expectations and trust we convey in them is priceless. I guarantee you, you, throw, you, could, you could go through your same list right now if people have done this, a teacher, or, but you'll go through your life and if people ask me today, what is the thing you're most proud of? It will be the effect I hope I've had on some other people as they've had an impact on me. That's an honest to God, that is my answer. But there was this one story I'll tell you quickly. I was in Rome. I had been asked to go lead our Italian business. Talk about a great, great assignment to run our Italian business when I was 34. And our business was in terrible shape, awful. I mean, and by any metric you would choose to read. Um, communists were about to take over. Berlin was one point away from beating the Christian Democratic Party. It's 1974. Uh, the CEO of P&G, Ed Harness, comes. This is his first visit as CEO to Europe. He comes to Italy for my business review. And I give this business review, and I don't remember what I said, but I knew I must have been really uptight, really uptight. And uh, going, to, and he was a big guy, football player out of Marietta, Ohio. And we went down the corridor, and you were outside Rome. And I get there, and he has a twinkle in his eye. He doesn't have to know to appreciate it. And he looked at me and he said, John, he said, you know, sometimes you just have to wait for the other shoe to fall. You're doing the right things. Everything will be all right. Now, I remember that today, 40 years ago, he said that to me in the Carter in a year. Now, what did he do? I didn't start to operate totally differently, but he, he conveyed a belief in me uh, and also a pretty good piece of advice, you know, take it easy, fella. You know, the world's not coming to an end. But he also said, you're doing the right things. So there have been so many people who, by their belief, by their role modeling of courage, Richardson Vicks, we were told not to bid up a dollar a share. At the very last moment, half the people in the room around the CEO, John Smale, said, we've gone too far. Stop. He decided to go up one dollar a share more. We got the business. Three years later, the head of Pfizer, and I were together, and he said, you know, John, you beat us on that bid for Richardson Vicks by one dollar a share. <laughs> one dollar a share. And you come to those moments, and you will, and it's a different point, uh, but I'll make it here because I may not get back to it, where your courage of conviction on something that's important will carry the day, uh, and you'll need to pu push back, and it'll be a moment, because every big thing I've seen happen in Procter & Gamble has been because a person Sometimes a group of people going against the grain pushed against that grain and made something happen. Our biggest technologies, our biggest entries into new countries, and so on. Yeah. Uh, what are some of your biggest risks? Misses? Biggest risks. Risks? Yeah, that you've taken as the CEO. I'd say, <sighs> ooh. Sometimes I don't view them as risk, but other people did. Uh, going in hell-mell to Eastern Europe, Russia, and uh, Dick Cheney was on our board, I remember, when we put through a $50 million appropriation to acquire a plant near Tula, Novomoskovsk. He came up to me afterwards. He said, John, he said, I approve that. I understand why you're doing it, but you ought to be prepared to risk, lose every one of those dollars we just appropriated. Um, going in there aggressively with the idea uh, that we wanted to be number one, Katie by the door, I mean, big number one. Uh, there were some risks and categories that we had felt that when we were going into China early. Um, they were all calculated. There's no point in taking a big risk or a risk unless you think the upside is big. Don't go into something if you don't think the upside is big. Going into China, going into uh, Russia, technologies on what have led to Bounty having a 40 share and so on. We were at one time at 20 and losing money. And we were facing risks. Are we going to invest another 20 and $30 million to create this technology? Or a lot of reasons why you could have said, we've been at this for five years. It's not working. We ought to give up. Was there a risk in investing more? Yeah, but the upside was so big. And I had such confidence in the people on the business who were saying, don't give up. It's a little words. They said, don't give up now. We can make this work. 
And by the way, that kind of thing coming from an individual is what makes, it, makes things happen. Somebody standing up for their conviction. Uh, I always remember that one on the, the root quote risk on that where the, the head Bob Haxby was his name, said just that. He said, please don't give up now. We will make this work and we signed the next check. Um, and, and that might not have happened if Bob Haxby hadn't said that in that kind of way. Uh, there have been risks in organization design, I suppose, but I have not, not looked at them. They are the risks, but what was taking was a risk staying in the pharmaceutical business, as we did, and eventually we left it. The marketplace changed. When I look at a real risk, and I'll say one more thing and stop, I ask, do we have the right to succeed big time? Do we have the right to succeed big time? Is the market large? If we achieve what we want, is there a big payoff? Do we have the people who can make it work? Do we have a technology base that gives us quite the feel we can not only do this, but we can build on it in the future? Uh, that's the way I evaluate it. And uh, uh, if, if you get a big idea, I mean, there have been risks for Disney and lots of things, but you know, sometimes you just follow your nose and go where your heart is. It's not all numbers. It's not all numbers, yeah. You've mentioned both that something that you like about Procter & Gamble is the, the culture and the emphasis on people. And you've also mentioned that uh, creativity is an innovation is what drives the business and that can start with individuals or with small groups of people. How do you balance that, that need for innovation and an emphasis on individual ideas and maintaining a broader company culture, especially when there are so many offices all around the world? I think importantly by emphasizing the individual. Um, I was talking to a group of first year P&G employees some years ago, and there was a young woman, probably about your age, and she held up her hand and she said, she said, Mr. Pepper, I have a question. And I immediately knew I was going to get a really heartfelt question. Yours is too. And she said, this company is so big. Uh, she said, there's so many levels. People are so smart. How can I possibly make a difference? And I said, I said to her, thank you for asking that question. I'll bet half the people in this room have that question having been here a year and having seen all the people and all the levels and so on. And I said, I knew I'd have that question if I'd been that thoughtful in a year, and here's how I answered it. None of this will surprise you. I said, the answer is, first of all, find something you really, really believe in, and learn all you can about it. Go to other people to learn about it. Do some horseback research if you can to validate it. But get something that you feel, it won't be a cure for cancer, but in the scope of the brand operation or product supplier R&D can make a difference. Second, present it, having done that, to whoever has to approve it, and present it with all of your mind and all of your heart. And I said that mind and heart part is really important. The mind part, yeah, you've got to have a rational presentation, you probably won't get much time. But the heart part, sometimes people feel are going buttoned up and all, and they won't convey how they feel about it. I said there's nothing that a good manager or leader likes more than having a young person in front of them who has an idea they've thought enough about to have a right to talk about it. They know it. Uh, and second, they care enough about it, they're gonna make this thing happen come hell or high water. And I've had people in front of me, they, that's, that's what you get. I mean, they have an idea and I'm just gonna make this happen. Next, having done that as well as you can imagine ever doing it, the first, be prepared for the first answer to be, well, we've tried that before. Or we don't do it that way, something along those lines. And I said, this is the moment of truth. This is the moment, because you'll hear that kind of thing. Um, this is when you've got to step back and see if I heard something that allows me to make the idea better or changes my mind about it, or if I heard something that still has me feeling that maybe I'm going to need to come back, but I still think this is a precious idea, and I'm not going to give up on it. And I go on and I say that all the, the big changes I've seen in P&G have come about in that way. We were about to get out of the shampoo business, other than head and shoulders. Uh, we were about to get out. And we we're talking about two-in-one shampoos, and the graveyard was littered with them. And there was a R&D group that said, we've got something different. We're going to make it happen. And they pleaded with us to put it in test market, even though it wasn't a big blind test winner. The numbers didn't. But they felt they had something bigger. It turned out to be Pantene and Vidal and Head and & Shoulders, the number one and two shampoo brands in the world. It never would have happened. Or a brand manager on Crest 
who had been turned down three times to bring a tartar control version onto Crest, believe it or not, because it wasn't to do with cavities. And she just said, this is crazy. People want to have tartar control when they use their denifers. You could wonder why she would have been turned down three times, I'm sure. And she came back a fourth time and we agreed and that became tartar control Crest and we stopped working on what would have been a whole new brand just on tartar control. So, of course you have to have, a lot of this is teamwork. I talked about Pixar. I heard somebody say recently, um, the best idea in the room is the room. The best idea in the room is the room. Now, uh, that gets back again to the value of collaboration and working with ideas one with another person. But nothing takes the place of the individual idea percolating with other people. I mean, very few ideas are totally right. A singular province. Okay, yeah. You've mentioned several times about some of the best moments in B&G happened when someone was willing to take a risk, stand up for their convictions, um, and you, you said, for by hell or, hell, how, hell or high water, make it happen. Did I say that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what about a time that you stood up for your convictions and it turned out to be wrong? And then, I, I was curious, A, how you dealt with it, and B, how did you have the courage to go up and stand up for your convictions next time you were at bat? Uh, well, I think there's no alternative to keep standing up for your convictions. The day you stop doing that, you're dead. The day you stop standing up for your convictions, it's all over. You'd never do that. Uh, but to answer your question, I've tried to learn from it. A, a concrete example. Um, I'm back to Italy again. And we finally got our established business in good enough shape where we can think about introducing a new brand. We hadn't been able to do that for a while. And we had a choice between introducing Mont Savon, bar soap, never would have heard of that, but it was the number one brand in France at the time, or introducing Pampers. Now Pampers at this time had just come into Germany, was doing okay, but not great. And the question was, which do we do? Pampers would be a much higher risk, much higher investment, not yet complete information, so we decided to go with Monsovon feeling we'll come back after we get a little more experience with Pampers. What happened was Linus, a local company, comes out with our whole Pampers plan while we were doing Monsovon, which ultimately failed, and they created a brand, 40 shared, which we ultimately 10 years later bought and acquired Linus. Now what did I learn from that? I said, if you've got your choice between going for something, even if it works, it's pretty small, or going for something big, lean heavily to go for what's big. How did I translate that? In my own mind, I'm literally going into Eastern and Central Europe. And I was absolutely committed. We weren't gonna go in with one brand or two brands. We were gonna go in in multiple categories. Same thing in China. So I thought I learned from that. And I go back to how I was brought up in the company, these great leaders I had. I honestly had an expectation that everything wasn't gonna work. I mean, half the stuff worked and half, half didn't or maybe Maybe it was 75, 25, what worked and what didn't work. Uh, but I, I, I had learned everything won't work, but you try to learn from it. And the big principle I learned on that, of course, was the other big one, if you ask me about the biggest mistakes, it was on Pampers in the United States. We had been really slow in going to shape diapers. Unbelievable how long it took us to recognize a shape diaper was better than a rectangular one. I won't get into that story, but again, it shows how you can convince yourself of something really wrong. And so we had finally gotten shaped, and the idea was to put every bit of effort to get that out quickly, and we faced a decision in doing that, should we wait one year to do the Pampers pull-up diaper? And we decided we'd wait one year, and I was involved in that decision. During that year, Kimberly Clark came out with a raft of patents, which has taken us decades uh, to overcome and come up with a better product, which we now have. What's the lesson there that I took? Never, ever allow yourself to be exposed on a big business in what would be a technological breakthrough. Never, ever make a decision that you could have had the consumer make for you. Because if we had put that out, we would have seen that all our assumptions, our underlying assumptions were wrong. We didn't think many people would want it because it was expensive. We thought the market would grow slowly. So the underlying assumption, and we didn't, and we didn't challenge them. Never miss a technological inflection point. I mentioned Motorola, I mentioned um, Eastman Kodak. Uh, don't miss a technological, and, and don't allow a competitor, don't you make an assumption about a competitor doing something that you assume they're wrong 
without testing it. And, and even, if, even if you find it's wrong, don't give that space away. Don't give that away. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Thanks again for joining us today. This has been great. Um, there's been a lot of pressure recently on large companies to get smaller. Um, news today of HP splitting up, eBay selling PayPal, yeah. uh, Kraft and Mondelez. How would you react to an activist investor? Maybe you've been in this scenario uh, during your career who shows up and says, Procter Gamble is too big. You can't be successful as a large company. We want you to split it all up, sell all the brands. How, how, would, how do you defend that in today's environment where uh, investors are focused on small, focused companies? Well, I mean, you listen to what they've said, think about it, see if they've got a point you made out of it, and then go on based on what you believe is right. Um, there's no other way to do it. I mean, I, I wouldn't ignore it. I would not assume that they're just dumb or mischievous. Um, uh, so I'd consider it. It would be unlikely you hadn't already considered this, uh, for sure. Uh, but, you know, they might bring up something simpler, like they want to have separate departments, sales departments for different lines of products. I'd listen to it. And if it were new, I'd consider it. But surely you're not going to be, you're not going to be led by that. A more, a, a more uh, difficult part is the emphasis on short-term profits and, and making sure that in the end, because you've got to perform today, but if that performance ever comes at the cost, at the price of not doing what's right for the long term, you're dead. A great decision by, as I go back to John Smale, and I was president of the company at the time, we had a choice. Our business was in terrible shape in the mid-80s in Procter & Gamble. We were losing share in laundry detergents, diapers, and Denifer's at the same time. You know, three big categories, share going down. And we were fortunate that we had big innovations in each of those categories at that time. We had Tide Liquid, we had, we had uh, Crest with Tartar Control, and we had Shaped Diapers. And we faced the question, are we going to put full marketing against introducing them in the right way uh, right now? And the consequence of that would be to have the first down profit year we've had in Procter & Gamble history since 1952. Or would we meter the marketing out over two years and not have the down profit year? And it took us all of about 30 seconds to make that decision, that we were going to put the marketing effort, get it right, have the down profit year, go to the street, go to the analyst, tell them exactly what we had done, which we did. I can't remember. I'm sure our stock took a short-term hit, but you know what? We went on to year after year after year of growth in our business, and the stock price always will follow that in due, you know, in due time. So. Um, that's my answer. Yeah. Last question. Uh, John's uh, gone through, uh, in, the, in the last fascinating hour, uh, a lot of onward and upward uh, success sagas that are, are true. Uh, they, they happen, and they happen uh, heavily uh, with your leadership. But it would be awful for anybody to think that you also didn't have to take on some tough crises along the way. Um, I think of some of your mentors, like uh, Ed Harness, you mentioned, uh, with the relied tampon and, and the, uh, the toxic shock syndrome that uh, P and G. You know, the, I'm not sure what, where the science was on that, but P and G took a position of principle uh, in the face of ambiguity of science. I wonder how that shaped other decisions that you made. You had, uh, you know, recently P and G has brought a, a light, slight crescent moon back in with their logo. And you, you know what I'm talking? When I first met you. And I think I know what you're talking about. The fourth time an evangelist went after Trey and G, suggesting it was a satanic symbol, and had to disappear. And now it's coming back in. And Disney on the board, you came in and we talked about the success of Bob Iger. It's fantastic. He's got another two years. But you came on at a difficult time there. The Eisner Iger transition yeah. was, you know, Eisner is one of the greatest media barons in history. He had another 20 years. Know, 12 of them are fantastic, but some of the latter ones weren't so easy. You're very creative. You had a lot of crises that you had to come into and, uh, and get us out of them really well, even succession issues as with some in the P&G, and that somehow you had a stabilizing and building influence. I don't know which of the crises along the way are the ones you thought were some of the most ones that you learned most from, you had common practices going into these crises that, that helped, uh, helped us learn from adversity. Well, I mean, the crises, you've, you've covered a, a wide range of them. Ones that, what, what, and, the, and you, 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 you know our company well, and you're right on all of them. The, um, 
the ones that involve consumer safety, as, as well I did, and I could name others, head and shoulders, are very easy. Uh, I mean, we never had technique, we never had scientific evidence that linked TSS to, to rely. But the question that uh, Ed Harness asked was, can you categorically prove to me there is no relationship between the two? And when the scientists said, no, we can't, we withdrew it immediately from the market, no questions asked, nothing about what it'll cost or anything else. Uh, we had a, an event uh, where, where we had some captured information from Unilever, uh, which we shouldn't have had, and I don't know how we got it, but I called Fitzgerald immediately, he was the CEO, and told him we had it. And people sometimes said, why did you do that? Why didn't you just hide it? Th th those are easy decisions. You know what's right based on that. Uh, others were financial that you talked about. I've had plenty of them. It seems like there's a 10-year plague uh, when it comes to business crises around financial. And you dealt with those by, one, trying to get at what the root is, getting reestablished on what we want to do, get a plan. There's nothing that a crisis makes it worse than being frozen in inaction and having everybody rallying, rallying around it. Um, you just have to keep pointing forward. I always remind myself in a crisis, why are we doing what we do? I think we have to remind ourselves, why are we doing what we do? Remind ourselves of previous victories that we've been through this before, seldom the first time. Get very realistic. What is the reality of the situation? Don't, no fuzzy wuzzies. Let's really, let's see what it is. Recalibrate on where we want to get. What went wrong? What is the new plan? Get everybody enrolled in it. And instill confidence. Not just the hallucination confidence, we can do it, but confidence based on the credibility of the plan that we've done it before and leadership standing in front of them who we already know and who has acquired respect. Um, I don't know if that's getting at your question, but it's a, it's, it's, if you take Disney, 2008, 2009, and I'll finish with this, our, it was a very difficult year for Disney, um, for, as everybody else. We made a lot of changes, but one thing we said we will never do is we are not gonna tamper with the consumer experience in our parks. We will not touch that. We will, our guests will not notice any difference, even though we've had to make changes in our cost structure, because that is precious. And that comes out of the fundamental service orientation and purpose, why we're here. And that guides what you do. And then you scramble. And then you scramble. It, uh, there's one, just one phrase that I'll, I'll leave you with around scrambling. Uh, I, I worked closely with Steve Jobs for many years. And he always sat just at my right. Um, he'd come in and Sometimes he'd be late, and I could tell he was bored to death during a great deal of the meeting, especially we'd get into financial reports. But a P&G person, when I was in a P&G audience, asked me, John, what is the single characteristic that most differentiated Steve Jobs for you in knowing him? And I hadn't thought about it. The answer was instantly clear to me. And I said it was his maniacal commitment to excellence. And I said, it's interesting. I've never used the word maniacal to my knowledge ever before. But it's the only word I could use. His maniacal commitment to excellence. And then the person asked me, have you seen that same maniacal commitment to excellence in P&G people? And I'd say that's a high bar in talking about it. But let me say this to you. I haven't seen anything really important happen in P&G if it hasn't involved some individual or team that hasn't had a maniacal commitment to quality, to excellence, to achieve a great result. I've just not seen it happen. So that maniacal commitment to excellence, isn't it interesting you'd use a word that comes to you after all these years that you can't ever remember either writing or saying before. Thank you, John. Why don't you all thank me? Thank you.